So let's look at the homework and the solution. So I said for May, June, we'll start with the processing costing one. Yeah, process costing. I said May, June exam and it's the process costing and it was question three so it was 20 marks so you had to do it for 24 minutes wow it was a multi-choice interesting different way of questioning all right so i'm going to read it through and it says that tumble pty limited manufactures a single product and they use process costing materials are added at the beginning of the process and conversion takes evenly throughout the process. The following inf information, excuse me, is available. So they give you the opening whip to be 20% complete, and these are the units and the costs. They give you what was put into production, the units, and also the cost attached to it. Give you completed and transferred the units only, and the closing whip was 90% complete. Okay. Then thereafter, they tell you normal wastage amounts to 10% of the inputs that reach the wastage point. They didn't tell you where the wastage point is, but they're telling you that it amounts to 10% of the inputs that reach this wastage point. And Tumbo uses the first in, first out method to value their inventory. Okay, wastage occurs when the process is 95% complete. So you start drawing um, and putting in materials is added at the beginning. Opening whip is 20% complete. And then your closing whip is 90% complete. Wastage point is at 95%. So you start thinking about those um rules there are three rules so we'll look at the solution management has prepared the following incomplete incomplete quantity statement so it means that chances are they might ask you to fill in so the quantity statement is already done for you but there's incomplete sections so the input part they've already put in your opening whip and product Put into production, right? What's missing here is your opening whip. You see this structure is of the first in, first out. So you split between the opening whip and the current production. But they give you what's been given, which is the completed and transferred units. So opening whip it's missing, and also their conversion percentages. Oh, percentages included here, but it's the amounts that are missing here. Normal loss, you have to calculate it. They need also raw material and also conversion. Then abnormal loss, they also say that it's missing. They need the units for raw material and conversion. Closing whip, they gave it to you, but they need the conversion units part. So it was an interesting question because normally you're the one doing the statement, but in this instance, the statement was given to you. And you needed to now find the following. Required A. They ask you to indicate the missing figures of the quantity statement by writing down your numbers 1 to 10 to indicate the portions that are missing from the quantity statement. And you do not have to show calculation. Wow. You don't even have to put the calculation. You just put your number and the answer. B, they tell you to explain why equivalent units for opening whip are indicated to be nil. Why? I actually like this question. This is a different way of testing a GC. Then they ask you to explain the difference between first in, first out and weighted average when it comes to calculation your equivalent cost per unit, what is that difference in a production statement? Then they tell you that assuming Tambo uses the weighted average to value their inventory, 
and the total uh, units for material and conditions uh, based on the on the information above. Calculate. Sorry. They're asking you very interesting question. I hope those who haven't done this question can go attempt it because I see it as a very insightful question. It tests it, it tests your your understanding of the principles. All right. All right. So I was just saying that I hope that you manage to go through the question if you haven't try to make time to go through it because it's a very good question it is a different way that um what's this thing that process costing is actually questioned um apart from the normal questions that we've done in this instance your quantity statement is provided you just have to calculate what's missing and they don't want you to show calculations. They just want the number and the answer. Sorry, and the answer. Maybe that's why they're saying eight marks. And then it asks you the theory portion of things, you know, explaining differences between how you treat different cost per unit according to the inventory valuation. And also, um, it also touches on production cost statements. It touches you on how to calculate your rent value when you have a normal loss. So it's a different, nice question. Um, I hope it was nice for those who attempted. Those who haven't, please try, go through it. So with the answers that we have here, what was number one? Number one was your opening whip. How did you calculate your opening whip? Uh, I've said 50,000 multiplied by 100% minus 10%, then it gave me 45. Right. Yeah. Yes, yes. And it's very important that you show that the 10% was taken out because this is first in, first out. You have to show that your inventory went through that loss because it was before the wastage point. So that means that that loss it will experience. So correct by doing that. And then um, when it comes to your conversions unit, how did you do that? And this one I've said 45,000 multiplied by 80% because yes. the, the completion is 80%. Yes, we needed to complete at least 80% of this opening work in this current period. So you are correct um there it is then we know all of us that number three which is current production it's the balancing figure right is the balancing figure between your opening whip and the difference between your opening whip and your completed transferred so there is your ninety thousand minus this 45 which is direct right i mean it's straightforward and uh, as a result what you've put in for your current in production, your units would be at a full amount, right? That's where for three, all of the numbers would be 45, 45, 45. Then number four, how did you guys do number four? Oh yeah, it's zero plus 45, sorry. And then it's the one where you said 80% plus this 45, then that will give you number five, right? So it's a summation of your opening and your current production. That would be four and five. So that's actually easy marks. Then how did you guys calculate your normal loss? How did you guys approach your normal loss? Uh, I think I've uh -huh. done it wrong. I've I've said uh, 150 minus uh, opening whip mm -hmm. multiplied by 10 percent. Okay. And others? Was it the same? Yes, it was the same. Okay. So number six. Let's see how they did it. So they take 150 and they minus the 15. 
the closing whip. Why? Because remember, opening whip says that if it was before the wastage point, you keep it, you don't deduct it. It's only after the wastage point that you deduct it. Are we together? And closing whip, on the other hand, it's the one whereby if it was before, you deduct it from your input. So hence, this 15,000, it is your closing whip. So please, 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 before you go into the exam, know those rules by head. Yes, correct. Then, same for raw material. And then how did you get your number seven, which is conversion units for your normal loss? Let's continue with whatever number that you have, but then how did you do your conversion units? Uh, the conversion units, I've said uh, 10,000, because I got it wrong there. Ne? Yeah. And then multiply by 95%. Oh, okay, cool. So, I think in such instance, you do get a principal mark for noticing that it was it's the wastage point that you use here on your conversion units. Okay, that it's at 95% and it's the amount that you've recognized. So you are right by saying that fine, it's the 10,000, but then it's 95%. So you're probably gonna get a principal mark for that one. Number eight, which is your abnormal loss, it's your balancing figure. Uh, that one is straightforward. Correct, it's your balancing figure. You take your input, uh, you take your closing, your normal loss, and what was put into the production, and that gives you what is your abnormal loss. And even number nine, you put it at, the point where there was a wastage point, which is 95%. Correct. And then your closing whip, it will be at 90%. So how did you guys find this? Was the only issue the normal loss part? Uh, on my side, yes. And others? Hi. On my side, I calculated the normal loss, okay? The only thing that I did wrong is the opening with I just took the 2000 and put it there. But you do understand why from that 90000 we needed to take out the normal yes. loss portion. Yes, I do understand. I just made it. Yeah. It's just yeah. Now, I'm happy that you guys attempted and you have improved quite a lot from how we were attempting the questions and and yeah give yourself a pat on the back you you've done well uh considering where we came from via process costing so i'm proud of that and then b what is why units raw materials for opening whip is indicated as nil do you guys know why Yes, because of the material was added at the beginning of uh, the process. Okay, so materials are added at the beginning of the process. Therefore, this means that materials of 50,000 were, were added in the previous month when the work commenced. No material are added to this 50,000 in the current period. So materials were added at the beginning of the process and this opening whip means that it has experienced that in the previous cycle. So there's no need for you to be adding material to this 50,000 units. Okay, so work on, yes, material this, but just add a bit of oomph to your response. Okay. Okay. Yep. Then... Explain the difference between the first in, first out and the weighted average method when you are calculating cost per unit on the product statement. What did you, production cost statement, what did you guys say? Uh, I just said the FIFO doesn't take into account the opening 
work in process costs for material and conversions. <laughs> okay, and others? Uh, and I've said uh, FIFO method separate opening whip from units that was put into production, whereas weighted average, it, it doesn't separate them. Okay. Cool. So here it is. Just to formalize, it says that first thing first, that assumes that your opening whip is the first group, right? To be completed during the current period. Group of units may may differ in terms of the equivalent cost per unit. The opening whip is charged separately to the completion, I mean the completed production, and the cost per unit is based on the current production pro, pro production cost, sorry, divided by the equivalent production of that period. On the other hand, under weighted average, it creates a single pool of units that are based on an average cost per unit. The opening whip is added to the current production and therefore you take those that total, you divide it by the equivalent production for that period. So in layman's term, it says that first in first out recognizes that the opening whip has its own cost. Oh my gosh, guys. We identify that uh, and we recognize that the first first out comes from the previous process so as a result, it has its own cost. Okay. So you charge it differently compared to the ones that are in the current period. Are we all together there? So that split that you're talking about, it also occurs when it comes to the cost. It, it identifies that the first one that is going to be completed is the opening width. Because we are on first in, first out. So that means that the first group of units needs to be completed first. Then there's the one that were happening during this process, that the ones that were put into the production, and they are also coming with their own cost, which is different from the opening whips cost. So as a result, first in, first out identifies and shows that first the opening whip comes at its own cost from the previous process, so it's charged separately. And then the ones that were put into the current production, those are the ones that will also be charged separately. So there will be two separate costs. In addition of your opening whip and this one. Weighted average on the other hand, it's a pool of units to come up with an average cost per unit. So meaning that that different cost of opening whip that comes from the previous process will now be added to the current production. So you're going to take the total cost that includes opening whip and current, then divide it by the equivalent production for that period, then they get a weighted average cost. Does it make sense? Does it make sense? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So, yes. so that's how you must explain it to get your full form up. Okay. okay. They asked you to calculate the cost per unit for raw material, conversion, and total. How did you guys calculate it? Hi, I've added opening web. And uh, what's that question again? Let me check the question. Can you please put the question on the on the screen so that I can answer? Okay. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I've said uh, material opening whip, and then uh, plus put into production, and then I divided uh, those two. I mean, I've divided with the with 150 that was assumed. And then the convention cost, I also did the same opening whip plus put into production and then divide by 146 
250 and then it gives me four four eighty five game okay, four rand eighty five for material and nine rand eighty for conversion and then but for the total I've said uh, I've added the material and conversion and then divided by the units and then it gives me seven okay, seven point something. Okay. Cool. Um, and then let's see how they've done it here. Yeah? So they took the material, they took all cost, you see, 257. So you see, they, they take for opening whip and what was put into production, they put it as together, then they divide it by the total input, right? Which is your what was put into the production, both your opening whip and what was put into production, then you get an average of 485. Conversion, same thing. You add the conversion cost of your opening and of your uh, what was put into production and by the equivalent, 146, the equivalent total, the 146. Then... Uh, it's equivalent units, then you get nine rand eighty, then you add those two, then get fourteen rand sixty-five. Any questions on this? This explains what we were talking about on C. That you take it as a single pool of units. So you take what was part of your material cost for opening and what was put into production. Conversion cost, same thing. Then you get your 14 rand 65. Any questions on it? Yeah, this one is fairly straightforward. I think it is. Yeah, it's it is. straightforward, yeah. Easy marks, straightforward. Weighted average is clean. Hmm. Very clean. And then they ask you that based on your answer on D, calculate the total normal loss rent value. So the rent value for normal loss would be uh, what is NLM thirteen five hundred and twelve thirteen five hundred. That is the normal loss and the abnormal loss. So you have to calculate it together. Then they. They said that the first normal loss is 4 rand 85, it's on the material. Then the 9 rand 80 is for the abnormal loss portion. And then they got the total of 191. What you could have done is just to, yeah, but yeah, rather it's separated, it's fine. Then that's how they got to their normal loss, total normal loss rent value. Okay. So I would advise those who haven't done this question, because I know that they haven't, another one confirms, they confirmed that they haven't. Please go do this question. Please make sure that you keep up with management accounting. I understand that other, other subjects, it's hectic, it's hectic everywhere. But don't fall behind because you are writing soon. Eh? So please don't fall behind. And then try practice, 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 because management accounting is like maths. I always say the more you do questions, the more you understand the principles. OK, so let's do a last quick question. Also, it was on standard costing. We asked for a homework for standard costing and it was question five. I hope that you also did it uh, by indication. Did you guys have time to do question five? I, yeah, no, I didn't get a chance to do it. Is it? So, given that, let's then do it as a practice one for today's class. So, what I'll do now is that, let me see how many minutes is it? 18 minutes, perfect. So, what I'll do now is that I will cover a bit of standard costing theory and then we do the question as a practice test. 
I mean, practice question as we always do. If that's okay, is that fine? Because we have like an hour, 30 minutes to go. I hope that's fine. Because the idea was that it was going to give us a prelude as to what we do in here. But given that you guys didn't have time to do the homework for standard costing, let's then do it now. Okay, because I'm just saying now, it will be after the theory, after the explanation. At the end of the lesson, we'll have 18 minutes. You do 18 minutes, we mark it together. And then the last five minutes, it will be the tutor valuation forms. Okay. We all on the same page now. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, I will send the question in the group. I did send it in the group. Hey. I'll just resend it again. All right. Cool. So last week, just a recap. And can we, can we get the answers for the previous question? Like that? Yeah. Or are you going to load it for us? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send it in the group. But then the ones who haven't done the question, I'd say just keep it to yourself to make sure that you do these questions under exam uh, condition, meaning you time yourself. The question is 20 minutes. Do it for 20 minutes, and then thereafter you can mark. Don't do the question and then immediately go to the solution when you find it that it's hard. Because in the exam, you won't get a solution. So you need to practice exam technique. And maybe if I may ask, the ones who've done the homework for process costing, how's your time, your timing going now? Is it improving or what's going on? When you time yeah. yourself. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it is improving because I tried to do it without even looking. I just did everything on out of my head yeah, and then so, it was just quick. Yes, so I'm saying that when I give you guys these homeworks or when we're gonna have a session now where I'm saying 18 minutes after we've gone through the theory, that exam technique of just working under time pressure, it is very crucial for exams. I don't know how to emphasize it because it separates you between a pass and a fail. And I'm not saying a fail like it's a bad thing. You find that it's disheartening when you see students with 48 or 40, because that indicates that you have the knowledge. Only issue here, it's exam technique. Being able to attempt a question under time pressure without luxury of looking at a solution or being interrupted. As I'm saying that when you're at home, if they say it's 20 minutes, you sit down, with no phone calls or people coming into your room, you put yourself in an exam condition where you are not interrupted for those 20 minutes. And when, they, and when the 20 minutes comes and it says that it's done, you just stop, you don't continue writing because it will give you an indication as to how it's gonna go in the exam. Do you actually finish questions within 20 minutes? If you don't, you start looking, what's taking my time? What is it that I'm not comfortable with? And then you go back to the theory, sort it out before you get into the exam. Very, very crucial. That's why I'm saying that, guys, go back to how you treat your normal loss for process costing, especially for opening whip and closing whip. Those rules are very important because they become crucial part of your quantity statement. Make sure you know it by head so that you don't even question yourself when you're doing exam questions. Okay, enough said with the lecturing, but I can't stress it enough. Exam, exam pressure, exam techniques are what makes a difference uh, in your uh, results. Okay, so last time we spoke about what is flex budget, what standard costing is, how do they derive to say this is the standard cost um, sheet, right? Uh, uh, no worries, no worries, Gloria. I'll send the. Do you have the WhatsApp? I'm answering as I'm going. Cool. So I was saying that last time we looked at standard cost, how does a company get to a point where they 
end up saying that this is the target, this is the standard cost or the standard quantity. We also spoke about budgeting, flex budget, what is the difference? So today, we said that all of everything that we've learned builds up to us looking at variance analysis. Variance analysis is looking at what you say is your target versus what actually happened. Right, and this brings into account um, formulas because you have to calculate these variances. And then I said, besides quantifying your variances, you have to give us the quantitative factors. These are the qualitative factors are reasons as to what why we are seeing a favorable movement or an unfavorable movement okay so the first one that we're looking uh, uh, we'll look at sales var variances i just want to see uh, we looked at this it's fine and i i always say i always advise that students should not cram but try to be familiar with the formulas just to say how do I calculate my quantity variance for sales how do I calculate my pricing variance for sales even for material even for labor your overheads so that you are familiar you don't get into the habit of being confused by the formula you know formulas are straightforward what you just need to know is what's the exit and you will see as we go. So I'm just going to read through. This is your module. Nothing fancy. Straight from there to learning units. And I'm just going to go one by one. If you haven't gone through the theory, well, you are in good company today. We are looking at the theory. Then we're doing the question. Oh. Where was I? Sorry. Sales variance, great. So a difference between budgeted sales revenue and your actual, maybe because of units that you sold, which is volume variance, or the selling price, right? Makes sense. What you targeted, only reason why there would be a difference, it's either what you sold was over and above what you expected, or it was below. That's volumes. And sometimes it's your selling price per unit. To say when you budgeted, was your price high or was it lower than what actually happened? So in the example, there's a revenue where your budgeted revenue is 570, but your actual revenue was 620. This gives you a positive variance, but you need to break it down to see how many units did you sell? What is that difference? And um also, as to what actually happened, was the tender that we got during the year, or did we have more sales where people now are buying more? So you need to bring uh, the difference, the gap between your budget and your actual sales to narrow it where we can get answers, right? So here it is. We know that the 400 units will be sold. Therefore, we budgeted sales to be 600 when you flex it, leaving a difference of 20,000. So your 600 sales versus 620 gives you 20,000. And how do you calculate it? So let's go to the calculation, sorry. So the result of the difference in the selling price per unit it's you taking your actual selling price minus your budgeted selling price multiplied by the actual units. So that's the first formula that we know that if I'm doing my sales variances, one of the variance things to quantify my variance, it's the selling price variance. And for me to calculate it, I need my actual sales I mean selling price versus my budgeted taking actual into place. 
So here it is. AS, ASP minus BSP multiplied by AQ. That's your calculation for various analysis. And uh, um, the answer here is 20,000. So that means that our actual selling price was more than the budgeted selling price. All together, are we all following? So that is one aspect. And if I may ask you, what could be when it comes to your head, why is it that what was budgeted in terms of selling price was less than what actually happened? What, what could be the reason for us to have a favorable class? Just think if maybe you have a business what could be in your your reason? Inflation. Inflation, yes. It could be like that. Price increments in your raw material, so you pass it off as a sales increment. Mm -hmm. And also special orders, right? It might be that you got new business that you didn't anticipate for. And as a result, it bumps up your selling price, right? It dilutes what you just targeted for, but correct. I like your... Also demand, demand of the product. The higher the demand, yes, the price. You must write those, yes. I was saying the demand of the product. Pardon? Demand of the product. Demand. Okay, but demand normally goes with volumes. Yeah. Yeah, but selling price, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would say the demand goes with volumes because it's the drive of volumes. Unless if you're saying that based on the demand, you decided to change your price. That's also another way of looking at it. All right. Okay, cool. Yeah, but if you're going to say demand, as I'm saying, you can always spin it to say that based on the demand, sorry, let me close my eyes, it's making noise. Based on my demand, uh, probably management decided to change because you always react to what's going on uh, in real time, normally when it's actual. Cool. Then that's sales. Then there's direct material. So with direct material, you will have your total variance, right? But this total variance is split into two. Where, um, before we get into this, um, this total variance is split into two. There's quantity variance and there's also pricing. Because what we're saying is that there's the difference between my standard quantity and my price versus the actual quantity and the price. But one has to see um, that there's quantity variance. So total material variance is made up of quantity and price variance. And the following uh, formulas are like this. I hope you guys are not the first time you see those formulas. There's your squat because I'm saying quantity, we're saying what was the standard quantity that you thought we're going to use? And what actually happened? But you multiply it by your standard price. So it's always what was the standard quantity that we thought we we're going to use versus what actually happened? But then you multiply it by the standard price because you are flexing. There's that flexing portion that's happening. For you to flex, you use this SP. Um, then you get your quantity variance. Whether it's favorable or unfavorable, you have to indicate it by the signage, right? Then there's price variance. Price variance is also like this. We say, what is the standard price I thought I'm going to buy this material for versus what actually did we pay for this material? 
then you multiply by your actual quantity. This is price variance. All in all, what we're trying to do is answer our total variance. But we split it into two elements, quantity and price. And some of the reasons they are given to you now here, but please note them, that if we have a material variance, the reasons behind that is that it, and remember I'm saying price, not quantity. The reason why, what we thought that our standard price would be uh, versus the actual would be, if there's any change, it might be because of what's happening in the market. It might be that by the time that we were doing a standard price, the market was not the way it is. You find that we are using the supplier, but when you get to the supplier, they've changed the cost in delivery now. Think now with how the petrol price is increasing, right? Do you think that your supplier will still base the delivery cost how it, how it has been over the past few years? He wouldn't. He would be saying that, listen, you also watch the news. You saw that now, my petrol, your petrol even, is high. So just like how I think one of the students said that um, you pass the cost to your customers, even your supplier will pass that cost to you rather than, rather than them absorbing it. Are we all in together? So we always look at what's happening in the market and how the market reacts most of the time affects your pricing. So as a result, if you find that your material price is high, there might be changes in delivery costs because of what's going on with the petrol. Are we together? I hope so. Then another reason why your price, you might have a price variance in terms of material, it's inefficient buying practices, meaning you're not looking at the cheapest or affordable supplier out there. You're just buying for the sake of buying. Or sometimes you're too loyal to your supplier that you don't even buy do your homework to actually see where else can I get the same quality of material but at an affordable price. Or which supplier can give me a discount, you know? You're so stuck in the supplier but you are not benefiting. As a result, you have inefficient buying practices where your actual price is different from what you thought it should be. Are we all together? That's some of the reasoning that you must think of when you see a pricing variance in your material. Sometimes none of the availability of your quality material affect your pricing and as a result in higher or lower prices for your material. So let's think about it. During the time where, was it by the Suez Canal, there was a, I'm, I think you corrected, but there was a, a ship that actually blocked a lot of ships that passed through the canal. What was happening to people who rely on certain orders arriving at a certain time so they can cater for their consumers. They had to go to other suppliers and you find that they don't give you the same quality as the shipment that's stuck in that Swiss canal situation, right? So as a result, you go for lower quality and you, if you go for lower quality, it might be cheaper, but chances are it's going to affect you here. Or it happens that you used to have a certain standard quality. Now, because of the Swiss Canal uh, blockage and your, uh, your stock not arriving on time, you are now forced to buy from suppliers that are, for, that are giving you quality, but at a higher price. Because they don't have that relationship with you. So do you see how broad a price variance and what it will bring in you being able to explain it. You just have to think 
beyond just saying it's unfavorable, it's favorable, all right? Um, then there's the trade discount I mentioned. You find that you have a relationship with the supplier. They tell you if you're buying in batches, this is the discount that you will get. So chances are in the actual terms, you'll say, I'm going to go and buy in bulk. And when you buy in bulk, there's a discount. All right. Then you have to look at reasons for your material variances. We just spoke of price. Then there's still the quantity aspect of it, because all we're trying to do here is to say what informed this variance that I see uh, when I compare what actually happened and what I targeted. So the material quantity variance brings in excessive, sometimes it could be because of low, low, lower quality that you bought. As a result, there's a lot of spoilage that happens. Sometimes you, you find that the material is so fragile. You know, sometimes where you get boxes and it, they'll put it all over to say that it's fragile. You might find that your labor, they are just careless with the material, then it ends up being wasted. Sometimes it's your machine. You don't maintain, you don't maintain and repair your machine. So now there are defects and as a result, when you are taking through one material, you have to do it twice or three times. Then you're wasting a lot of your material because you're not repairing your machinery. Sometimes you don't mix your materials well and there's wastage. So, or sometimes you find that people steal your material. So do you guys understand the concept between material quantity variance, and the pricing variance. What I'm mentioning is very important that you understand because there are questions that ask you. You might find that, oh, yes, great. I understand the formula. Question comes, they give you favorable, unfavorable, and they ask you, what could have informed this variance? What are those factors that would have been the reason for this variance. You have to know them. Make sure that you can make these examples in your head so that you can be able to write them down altogether. So that was direct material. Then there's direct labor. It's the same thing of saying that what were the standard hours, what they were supposed to be, and what actually happened. And we are still trying to figure out the variance between what I expected my cost to be and what happened. You also break it down into two elements, which is direct labor efficiency variance and direct labor variance. The efficiency part looks at the hours worked by your labors, where we're saying, what are the standard hours that you feel are needed to complete this work versus what she actually worked at the standard rate? Whereas direct labor rate says that what was the amount that we're supposed to pay Rishibe per hour and what did we end up paying her? And by the actual hours worked. So that's your rate variance. If I'm going to ask you guys, since we've been talking about these variances, what do you think would inform your efficiency variance, whether good or bad? What are those qualitative factors under direct efficiency looking into standard hours? Why would my standard hours be different from my actual hours? It's inefficiencies in the manufacturing department it could be like the flow of raw materials the way it flows from department to department how would that affect hours 
uh, people are waiting instead of being actively productive, instead of having the material at their disposal, they now waiting for their hours. So that's lost productivity time. Yeah, I like that. So when you answer, get to that point where you say loss of productivity hours, then hinting that it's loss in productivity hours. That will give you a full mark where you end up saying, as a result, you have loss in productivity hours that increases your actual hours as opposed to what we thought that it would be. Right. So make sure you tie to these two at the end. I like that one. Thank you. And then others. What would cause my efficiency to be favorable? I mean, I'm, yeah, favorable, not I'm favorable, but favorable. Favorable would be excellent planning and coordination. Meaning? Meaning that uh, workflow is spontaneous on time. Okay. Uh, when you say planning, what do you, give me an example. Like uh, in a production environment, your your days are planned. Well, your production is planned in advance, right? So, which means that your material flow and uh, labor for the job is already planned. So, it's just the instructions that are given is uh, well in advance, and the team is fully aware of what needs to be done for the day, like the type of production that's going to go out the material that's going to be used and uh, which machines are going to be used. So it's all part of that planning process and the instructions to the team. Yes, yes, yes. So in such instance, that means that you would have qualified people who know how to plan. Yes. Yes, so that drives efficiency. Like supervision. Yes. As, like the manager or the supervisor would drive that, right? Yes. So when you have 25 supervisors, it drives up your efficiency. Yes, okay. because they're leading a team. Yes. But are we all understanding as to what could drive efficiency? Um, others, besides Joanne, thanks Joanne for your contribution. So efficiency, we'll look at some of them. So let's look at them here. So when you don't train people, it brings you inefficiency because people are now going to waste your material. People don't know how to use machines. It's just chaotic because people are not trained. And like Joanne say, said, if people don't have the correct instruction that delays productivity. So when you have incorrect instructions to employees, as a result, people will be idle. People are not efficient. When you bring a substandard material, it means that people are going to work more hours. So the standard of your material also plays a role. If your machine it has a defective um if it has a, if it has a, if it has an issue way instead instead of ironing this shirt once we iron it three times to remove the wrinkles because you are not repairing your equipment or your material it will cause people to work more hours we spoke about inefficiency Joanne was correct uh of the supervision if there's no supervision there won't be any efficiency. Sometimes we forget about the working conditions. The working conditions also play a role. Poor production planning. I mean, scheduling, you mentioned it. There it is. So I'm saying try to visualize what happens in a production or factory when it comes to labor. What could delay people from being productive? Are we all together? Because efficiency results into productivity, and as a result, you need to be able to make those pointers as to 
Why is there loss in productivity? Then you are then asked to talk about the rate variance. And with the rate variance, if there's change in the basic wage rate, that means that how much you pay people. Um, if there's change in terms of how you pay people, as a result, what's going to happen is that your labor rate will change. Okay? Over time, over time, we have to take that into account. When you pay overtime because there's a huge demand or there's a seasonal, now people want ice cream every day, you end up now having to hire more people because they need to meet up with the demand. It's going to increase your labor rate. And then sometimes when you appoint lower, I mean, your unskilled workers, you pay less fees so as a result of that you will see a variance in labor with what you pay people then variable overhead variances so we spoke about things we spoke about uh, material we spoke about labor there's also variable Overhead. We are also trying to get the difference what causes this total variance. So even with this one, you have to look at efficiency and spending rate. What could be the reason why? Because variable, remember, it has to go. Sometimes they tell you that it's based on hours or it's based on units. But in this instance, you find that it is based on hours. So it's similar to labor where we look at your spending between your standard rate and your actual rate on your actual hours. And then your efficiency, it's also the same where we're looking at the actual hours versus the standard hours. So it's similar to your labor. The only difference is that you need to look at what could cause a variable overhead variance and also for efficiency and your spending i'm just gonna fly a bit here so with your variable overheads poor condition your indirect labor they are inefficient your indirect material remember variable now speaks of indirect so indirect labor it's inefficient your material it's inferior and the tools that you are using, they've got defects. That could be the reason why it's unfavorable. Then uh, spending rate, it's the negotiation with your suppliers and there's faulty standards in your indirect material. So know those reasons, make note of it, make sure that you understand them. Then there's fixed overheads portion also. With the fixed overheads for this course, we'll be looking at only the overhead spending variance. This one is similar to where you look at your applied fixed overhead versus the actual. That's how you calculate your fixed overhead difference. And as I'm mentioning and I'm saying it again, you have to know why do you have these variances? So for fixed overheads, there might be a situation where there was non-availability for certain services. There's inappropriate use of facilities. You thought that you're going to use the space in the factory. Now you're using more, but you don't understand why you're using more. You have to understand why are you renting this specific factory, right? And there's ineffective control in spending. And also increase in cost of external services. So what I've mentioned here is that you truly need to understand why would there be a difference between what you estimated in terms of your fixed overhead versus what actually happened. All right. Uh,
Then here they just say, look at the wording, price, rate, variance. Then they even give you the calculation of saying, how do you do your quantity and also your pricing differences? Okay, I think with that being said, let's try an example before we do a question. I'm just trying to get that so that I can see if you were taking note. Um, just give me a sec. If they do, I'm just trying to see a nice question for this purposes uh, before question three. Just give me a sec. Mm. Okay. I think let's do the question because they do not provide solutions. And I'll try to figure out how to get the solutions for some of the questions in here. So let's do the question now. Let's do the question because in your unit, they do not provide the solution for some of the questions that they've given you there. But um, we do have a question here. So let's do a question and there's plenty more. I just want to use the remainder of the time on questions so that we can make sure that you understand how to apply the formulas and also be able to interpret your answers. So we're doing question five, which was supposed to be your homework. It's 18 minutes. I go to it, question five. So we are dealing with prepaid meters, which manufactures prepaid electrical devices, and they say they supply to the city of Tuani. So the prepaid that you use to put in your electricity, that's the company that we are working with here. Uh, the company has a manufacturing plant in Roslin in Tuani, and they use standard costing. The company uses two types of material for manufacturing these devices. There's material one, which is CTA one, material two, CTA two. The company has appointed you as the financial director to assist them with the best, uh, to be the best company in terms of the revenue and the services that they provide. So that means that you must give them some insights, right? Your first task is to assist prepaid meters with standard costing. The following budget, they've given you a budget, was produced based on sales of 9,000 units. So they were budgeting to sell 9,000 units for the year 2013. And this is the information. They give you the budgeted labor hours. They give you the rate. 15 rand per hour and they give you the standard quantity for material A and also the price but also this is the cost okay then another information that's being provided here it's your actual results so they give you the actual production it's 8,000 units what actually happened Actual labor hours is 80,000. Your labor cost is 1.6 million. So they didn't give you the rate. You see, then material that was purchased and used, they tell you that they've used 500 kgs for material A, 400 kgs for material 2, and they gave you the total cost. All right for actuals that they spent on this material. First question that comes is that you are required to calculate the following variances. It's the labor rate variance, it's the efficiency variance, and the total labor variance. Question two asks you to calculate the material purchase price for both material one and two. Then C asks you to do a true or false statement where they're saying that you, you'll see standard costing may assist the financial director 
in setting budgets and evaluating performance. Number two, the standard costing, uh, amongst others, the reason for material price would be failure to take advantage of quantity discounts when you buy in bulk. So it's pretty much straightforward. You just have to now take, I said it's 18 minutes, 18 minutes and do the question. It's asking you to calculate and it's basically on labor and material variances. And then there's a true or false statement just to test that you understand what you're doing. So I will give you 18 minutes. Okay, cool. So can we attempt it? It's 18 minutes to do the question and then we will talk. Okay, Refilo can't see. But then Refilo and I increase it. You can't see other parts, eh? Uh, you'll tell me when you need to get to the other part, which is the true or false, but try push A, B, A and B, all right? So you'll tell me to go to C when you get to C. So I'm gonna give you 18 minutes to attempt this question, and then we will talk and see how you approach the question and look at the solution together. All right, so your 18 minutes starts now. All right, time is up. Did you guys manage to finish? How did you find it? I think I managed to do it, but the fact is that when you're rushing it, your formats, I mean, do they want steps in your calculation or you just put the form formats and then you just put your answers in, you know, or you write whatever and then just put your answer in thereafter? Okay. I hear you, in terms of format, we'll look at how the format is, the standard format. And um, others in class, Refilwe. Yeah, and I think I'm with uh, Ms. Francis, for, you know, what is the format? Because you just want to get through it, but you're not even sure what is. Am I going in the right direction? <laughs> okay, no, please. you know the formulas, but you just yeah. put the formulas and you just put in the numbers. But obviously, some of them you got to calculate the rates, etc., first before you can yes. change it. Yes. So, we do you do the calculation and you just plonk in that calculation and just continue, like just substitute those. Um, actual hours, standard hours, and just carry on and just put the end answer at the end because you're fighting against time. <laughs> to take it into three or four stages thereafter. That's yeah. the point. Yeah, I hear, I hear what you guys are saying. I agree with you. Yeah. I, I, do, I do understand it. So let's try look at the solution in terms of this format. I think formatting, you always see it with doing more questions as to how they answered. Like you were saying, do they care about the formula? Do they care about how you got to the answer which informs the formula? Let's see. So, A, labor rate variance. If I go to labor rate, how do you calculate labor rate variance? The rate portion, what's the formula for that one? It's actual hours multiplied by actual rate. And then 
standard rate times actual hours. And then I've set 80,000 multiplied by 20 and then 15 rent multiplied by 80,000 and then give me 16,000 and 12,000. And then I've set 160,000 minus 120,000. It gives me 40,000, uh, 400,000 and then it's favorable. And others? Did you follow the same route or was there a different calculation or formula that you applied? Yes, I followed the same route, but isn't it unfavorable because the actual is um, higher. higher than the, than the standard? It's unfavorable. Because what we say is that the labor rate looks at how much did we actually pay the labor? I was making an example of refilue. How much did we actually pay refilue versus what we thought that or what we expected that she'll be paid for the hours that she spent to produce this product, right? So the formula, yeah, it's just that I think it's Kola, uh, how you go about it is really long, but um, the formula says actual rate minus standard rate, then you multiply by the actual hours because the common denominator is the actual hours, right? So how did they get the standard? You always look at the formula that you have and say, what do I have with me? And then you try plot it down and solve for the x, which is the unknown. So here, there's two ways to approach it, right? The way where you say, what is my actual cost? They gave it to you. Here it is, actual labor cost. And they said, what is my actual hours at the standard rate? So that's your way of doing it, Kola, uh, to say. But if you're comfortable with it, stick to it. So here you are flexing that budget. This is what we call about flexing the budget because you're taking the standard rate and applying to the actual work that was done. So the standard rate is the 15 rand multiplied by the 80,000 gives you 1.2. And to Robin's point, in this instant what we actually spent was more than what was expected to be spent so as a result it's an unfavorable variance because it's more by four hundred thousand the other way of calculating it is getting what is my actual rate my actual rate it's my total actual cost 1.6 million this one you divide it by the 80,000 hours, which is actual, which gives you 20 rand per labor hours. Then you take your 20 rand, which is your actual rate, you minus the 15, which is your standard rate. Already it indicates that you've spent more. That's the five rand. But you have to multiply it by the actual hours, which is the 80, then you get to unfavorable 400. Any question? For me, I actually use the second method. Yeah. Whereby okay. you just take the difference between the two and you take the actual number of uh, and divide it to give you the rate, like the 1.6 over 80, so I got 20. Yeah. And then I took the 20 and I minus the 15, and then gave me the 5 and I multiply by 18, gave me the, the the variance of 400,000, the unfavorable variance of 400,000. Great. So in terms of format in this instance, it's either you follow the Gola route, which is taking actual cost minus the flex cost, which is standard rate multiplied by the actual hours. Difference between the two gives you unfavorable variance. Or you have the option of taking the actual rate, find out what is that actual rate, minus, so minus the standard rate multiplied by the actual hours. Two ways of going into it. It depends which one are you comfortable with, and sometimes it depends which one is quick.
And what's very important in this instance is that after these calculations, ask yourself, did we overspend or underspend? In this instance, we overspend by 400,000, making it unfavorable. Right, so you see, you, you, if, but if, if the favorable or unfavorable is incorrect, you get a deduction of half a mark. So you need to get this variance correct to say, is it favorable or unfavorable? It's very important or else they deduct. Okay. It means I was going to get deduction. Yeah, eh? yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's what I'm saying it loud. So that you, you need to know after calculating, is this favorable or not? Because it counts. Efficiency variance, how did you guys approach that? I've used the same method. Uh, it, it was uh, eight actual hours multiplied by standard rate. And then standard hours multiplied by standard rate, and then 80,000 80, multiplied by 15, and 90,000 multiplied by 15, and then it gives me 120, again, 1,200,000 and 1,350,000, and then the difference is 150,000 negative, and then I've said unfavorable as well. Okay. So, with number two, you take, we're going to use this one. You take your actual hours. How much, how many hours did Refueler, sorry for using your name, Refueler, but how many hours did Refueler take to do this work? This is what we expected her multiply by the standard rate. So in this instance, the actual hours multiply by the standard rate gives you 1.2 million. The standard hours allowed. How did they get to it? They took 90,000 hours which were budgeted, divided by the 9,000 units which is what you're saying it's how many hours per unit was it budgeted for multiply by the actual hours so you are flexing your hours because the ninety thousand it's your budgeted hours but you had to flex them to get what would be the flexed hours as a result there's no difference so it's neither favorable or unfavorable. Do you understand it? This portion. Just repeat that once again. So which, what you're saying is that if we take the units that were manufactured, right? 9,000 for budget and 8,000 for actual. The labor hours utilized to make those units were 10 a piece, right? Because it's 90 divided by 9, give it 10 hours per unit. Mm -hmm. And 80,000 hours divided by 8,000 units give you 80, it's sorry, 10 hours per unit. So mm -hmm. what we're saying is that because the unit, uh, the hours that it took to manufacture the units were equal, so there's no variance. There isn't. In this instance, uh -huh. it makes sense. In this instance, you met the target. Yeah, yeah. So you utilize the same uh, standard number of hours per unit. Basically. Yeah. But you understand this portion of flexing these hours that you can't use 90,000 units. I mean, 90,000 hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the 90,000 hours was utilized for 9,000 units. So mm. how much would it mm. cost to make, or how many hours were used on for one unit? Yeah. Mm. So the efficiency is you got to bring it to a unit point and then times it by the rate. But this unit point is 
budgeted, right? You're trying to get the standard. Mm. So, others are quiet. Thank you. I, hope, mm, I hope you guys understand. Yeah. So, it makes actual sense. It makes actual yeah. sense because, I mean, it's the same amount of hours that were worked to produce the units based on what was actually budgeted for. Yep. So, oh, okay. I understand what you're saying, but, oh, okay, I see, uh, I see it now. Because I was about to ask, where did you get the 9,000? But I can see it on... I see, 90 okay. hours, this budgeted hours were for 9,000 units. But the budgeted hours of, of 9,000. And then what about 8,000? 8, 8, where did you get it? It's actual it's production. Actual production. Because what we're saying is that this 90 hours that were budgeted were for 9,000 units that were budgeted. But we're trying to close that gap between budget and this. You have to flex it to say, okay, what is my standard hour per unit applied on this actual thing? How do you flexing the budget? You creating a medium, the middleman between budget and actual. That's your flex budget. Hence, you needed to find the standard hour per unit. You multiply by the 8,000. You get the flexed hours, your standard hours. You compare it with this 80,000 multiplied by the 15, the standard rate. And then we found that it was 1.2 million. So there's no difference between the targets, the two. Okay, okay I get it. I yeah. understand that. So always remember, sometimes they give you the flex, but normally with the efficiency rate, you always have to flex, eh? Hey? Just check, though, on the information that they provide you, that you have to flex your budget here. You can't use your budgeted hours because it's on 19,000, so it's not apples with apples. Okay. So total labor variance, what you would do is take the variance of your rate sometimes. Yeah, that's the one that I know. So there's two ways of approaching it. You just have to choose which format you are comfortable with, guys. There's the one where you're going to say, what is my actual cost? That 1.6. And what is my standard cost? It's the 10 hours that we calculated, multiplied by 8,000, multiplied by 15 rand, 1.2. It gives me 400 unfavorable because you overspend. Or I was going to say you take your, your rate variance, which is that 400 unfavorable, plus your efficiency variance, which is the zero, that gives you the total labor variance, which is 400,000. How did you guys approach this one? Which way did you go with? The easier one. <laughs> yeah. Because you calculated it. So it's yeah, really so there's no need for you to be calculating it again. Yeah. I agree. Okay. So is this where you guys ended in terms of the question? Did you guys do B? You said you didn't, eh? I no, I didn't do it. Didn't get there, no. Wow. <laughs> So that means that it's nine marks multiplied by 1.5. Is it? Wait, sorry. It's, uh -uh, it's 1.2. So it's nine multiplied by one. Sorry, uh, it's 15 months by 1.2. 1.2, yeah. So you take nine multiplied by 1.2. So you guys spend 18 minutes on a 10-minute portion. It was supposed to take you 10 minutes to do A. Or you could have even said, if you are seeing that time is not of the essence, you go to C, you get your two marker, guys. Whether it's true or false, true or false, your answer. Then you'll know that I'm remaining with B. But let's go to B. I'm just saying that how you approach a question in an exam, I always say you don't have to start with A. Always start with the easier marks because 
That's where you score, you get also uh, a mood uplifter enhancer to say that I've got this. Because sometimes when you start and you get frustrated with A, it spoils the whole paper. So always start with the easier marks. That's your game plan. Because now you spend 18 minutes on a nine mark and leaving six behind. You could have done A, then go to C, then be stuck with B. But at least you'll know that you would have passed this paper. That even if your efficiency is wrong, but you, you, you are fighting for your life here with two marks. Okay. Remember That's exam? Not yeah, this is, yes. It's just one of those things that you learn the hard way as a student because you just yeah. want to. But now you know, okay, when you get in there, do what you can and leave the hard stuff later. So. Yeah, so that you have, you, you're pushing the easier marks because you'll know that when you push the easy marks, you're spending less time on those easy marks. That means that it will give you ample of time to do the big questions. Or where you know that probably you might get stuck on one certain aspect of the question. So try get the easy ones out of the way, then you will fight on the rest of the paper. Then to leave the easier marks and focusing on the part where you're not even sure. All right, so, but just make sure you label. Labeling is very important. Um, so B, you guys didn't look at B, but material price. This is how there's two options. So there's the part where we're looking at how much did we actually spend for this material versus what we thought it should be multiplied by the actual quantity. So it was for material A and B. So material CTA1, our actual quantity. So you always, I like writing it down here eh, to say, okay, AP, SPAQ. I put it there, then I'm like, okay, what do I have? So I'd say AQ sorted, I have it, it's 500 kilograms. They gave it to me here. So I know I've got AQ. Do I have AP or do I have SP? So SP they gave me, it's 19 rand. So I know that SP is there. Did they give me AP? AP, which is actual price, that's the X that I'm trying to resolve out of this whole formula. So I've got the AQ, I've got the SP. What I need is AP, actual price. So it's the 24 that I need to find. Okay. Then you go get it, get the 24 minus the AP. I mean, the SP already, I can see that I've already overspent. So that means that my, my variance will be unfavorable because it's the difference between the two multiplied by the five. Another person would say, what was the actual cost which I was given, which is the 12,000? And what is my uh, flex cost, which is AQ multiplied by SP? It's the 500 which I have and the 19, it's 9.5. The difference between the two, I've overspent by 2.5. So you would need to decide which method are you comfortable with. Any questions? That 24, you had to take the 12,000 divided by 500 kilograms, then you get 24. Are we all understanding how we got to here it was straightforward if you look at it in hindsight that you just had to calculate your actual price which was 24 because everything else was given or another person is saying i actually have everything i just had to calculate it calculate these two 9.5 then it's 2.5 so there's two methods, you choose which one are you comfortable with. So material CTA2 is the same formula 
AP minus SP multiplied by AQ. You have AQ. It's 400 kilograms. Here it is. Do you have your standard price? They gave it to you. It's 20 rand. Do I have my actual price? That's what I need to go and find. You have your total cost. Here it is, 6,000. Divided by the 400, you get your price to be 15. So already when I compare 15 rand with my standard of 20, that means that I underspend. So it is a favorable variance. So you take that five, multiply by the four, and you get 2,000. Another person would have said, I already have my actual cost. I just have to flex this one. Use my standard price, multiply by AQ. 6,000 versus 8,000 is 2,000 favorable. Uh, we know that standard costing helps people with budgets and evaluating managers. Performance, it's true. That's what I'm saying, that you shouldn't have lost this one marker, guys. It's true. And we know that sometimes when your material varies, the reason might be failure to take into account your quality discounts. It's true. So you could have gotten your two marker there. It's true and true. <laughs> All right. Can we the have the on our WhatsApp? Can we have the, that solution that you've been showing us on our WhatsApp? Yeah, yeah I will. Give me uh, the first question is the labor. I got them wrong. I only got the, 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 the material ones right. Okay, then you will have to yeah, then you will have to revisit your labor rate, do more questions around labor rate and efficiency. Make sure you are familiar. Do the question, just see where did you get it wrong. Mm. Okay, cool. So there's a chat, there's in our chat box in Teams, there's a uh, link that Ms. Puleng sent when we started the uh, when we started the class. I'm gonna paste it again. Can you please just do it for five minutes? If you don't mind, please. It's part of the evaluation forms that the facilitators need to do based on the tutorial classes that I'm doing. Please kindly do it. Let me know once you've done it, and then I will, from my side, send out the solution. It should take you about five minutes, guys. It's a form. Click on it. Can you guys see? I must also paste it in WhatsApp. Please do it. Kindly asking you to do it. Very important that they get feedback. Uh, Not a problem, we will. So pasting it in here. So just click either in WhatsApp or here. And then once you've done it, just let me know. Uh, from my side, I know that I need to give you the solution for the process costing. Also the solution for the standard costing. Thank you. 